Uh, we will continue the symposium uh, with an online uh, keynote speaker, Fred Richin, who is Dean Emeritus of the International Center of Photography and former professor of photography and imaging at New York University's Tisch School of the Arts. Can you hear me, Fred? Yes, I do. Very good. And we can uh, see and hear you perfectly clear. And um, you're welcome to start your presentation. Welcome to Lanskuna. Well, thank you for the invitation. I'm sorry I'm not with you. It's unfortunately a different world than last time I was there. So I'm gonna um, you know, give this presentation. Unfortunately, I cannot see you as I'm doing it, but uh, I will do my best um, here. Oops, so I have to share the screen. So I'm assuming you can see the presentation. Yes. yes. Good. So I'm going to be talking about photography as being very different in the 21st century than the 20th century. We use the same word, but it's a different medium in many, many ways. And we have to acknowledge that if we want it to have any impact um, in, in terms of our practice. I wanted to begin, of course, by acknowledging the work by Kent. Uh, which is on exhibit right now, because I think what Kent has done, not only in this project, but in previous projects, is he has embodied many of the more progressive ideas in the medium in terms of transparency, responsibility, ethics, a hybridization, a sharing of power, a sharing of perspectives, with with diff different um, you know witnesses with 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 the protagonists with the people that he's documenting, and and so on. I, I've written about it in the book uh, A Tree Called Home, so I want to acknowledge it, but move on and discuss uh, in a broader sense, you know how photography has moved on from the 20th century. I began my career in 1973 in October. So it's just about 48 years. So I've lived through that first era and the era that we're living in now. So the last century is not this century. And by that, I mean, for example, Christmas Eve, 1968, the photograph by an American astronaut of the Earth. It's the first time we ever saw the Earth from outer space. It seemed very fragile very vulnerable, very alone. And it spurred on 16 months later, Earth Day, uh, April of 1970, postage stamps and a general acknowledgement of the environment that we were the stewards of the Earth, that we were responsible, that we had to do something. And in this era of the diminishing of biodiversity, of climate change, environmental, degradation, it's very difficult to find iconic imagery that pull people together at this point. It was a different era then. And I think sometimes we continue to search for the same kinds of images as the last century. And it's a question whether in the era of cell phones, of social media, of alternative facts, of fake news, of the disappearance of print media, whether we will ever find what we're looking for. So then the question becomes, what else do we do? This is what uh, I grew up with in the 1960s and 70s, the Vietnam War, the front page of newspapers. Everybody had to pay attention to it, the front page of a magazine. It had the hierarchy of importance. If the New York Times, the Daily News, Life published it, we had to pay attention to it. We may agree or disagree on the conduct of the war, but the photograph served as a reference point. We would be in trains and subways, buses, cafes, and able to discuss with each other what we were reading. These kinds of images, this kind of news created community. Many years ago, I created the first multimedia version of the New York Times in 1994-95, and I showed it in Paris to a group of photographers. I thought I was doing them a favor, but the French photographers hated me. 
really, really were angry. And I said, why? I'm just showing you something that, you know, well, multimedia, more video, more photography. And their response was that I had ruined the cafe because when they go to get a coffee in the cafe, they don't know who to sit next to anymore. If everything is happening on a laptop, on a cell phone, they don't know if somebody's reading a right wing, a left wing newspaper. It's, it's difficult to build community. And I think they were right. I think since then, we've created on social media all kinds of tribal communities, but these communities are sometimes you know, very, very open and interesting and informative. And sometimes they're just uh, based on ideologies that have very little to do with, with the facts of, of what's going on in the world. So I just wanted to point this out. This is 1968. Look Magazine, the second most important picture magazine in the United States. And they took the occasion to use pictures by Catherine Leroy, who was 23 years old at the time, a French photographer who was working in Vietnam. And they ran, they published a series of her photographs and her texts in Look Magazine, and they used it for an editorial asking the United States to stop the war. It started, the photographs on the preceding pages are not published by Look to shock you into realizing that war is hell. We've all been shocked before in our living rooms watching violent death on 24-inch screens. We should know by now that war is hell. Vietnam is, after all, the third big one of our generation. Look publishes these photographs to remind you of some things many Americans seem to have forgotten, that people and nations make mistakes, that people and nations can learn from their mistakes, and that in the process of rectifying a mistake, a person or a nation can grow in wisdom and strength. The Vietnam War has been a mistake, destroying something precious in the word America. And they go on asking the United States to withdraw from Vietnam. This is 1968, the war would end seven years later. And I wanna point out that Catherine uh, was 23, the same age as Robert Capa when he made the picture of the falling soldier in the Spanish Civil War, but has gotten very, very little credit for this. A French woman uh, in an American magazine, being her pictures and the text being used to ask the United States to stop a war. If you're interested more in her work, on the bottom right, you see the website. We have a foundation, a dotation, of which I'm the president. Um, and she, she did much extraordinary work. But this kind of thing does not happen today. A magazine, the photographs do not have the strength. The war in Afghanistan, the longest war in American history, there are no iconic photographs from it. Photography played very little role in terms of people deciding whether the war was moral, immoral, should continue or not, whereas in the Vietnam War, it played a major role. And one of the works from the Vietnam War gets at the issue I think that we're trying to talk about in this conference, which is the exploration of systems, the underlying systems versus the symptoms. Much of photography is the low-hanging fruit, the easy images or easier images of the symptoms, of, of, of the victim, of the explosions. But what really causes a war? What, what is it about? And Philip Jones Griffith's work, Vietnam Inc., 1971, 50 years ago, this was published. He stayed in Vietnam for two and a half years to photograph. He laid out the book, he designed it, he wrote the text and photographed it. And his argument was that the war was a corporate takeover. It was an economic war. They had iconic images. He had iconic images in it. Um, but what he was arguing was something else, that this war was not about what it was supposed to be, about freedom, liberty, and so on, democracy. So for example, this picture, he captions, U.S. combat troops arrive, outnumbering the enemy three to one, and possessing the most sophisticated military hardware. The job seemed easy. Earlier, spirits were high among the troops, intoxicated as much by the spectacle of their own strength 
as by the cold beer delivered to them daily. So he's undercutting his own picture. This is not a World War II image of the good versus the evil, the good versus the bad. These are people, he's arguing, who had drunk beer. They were intoxicated. When I showed this at New York University, a friend of mine who served in the war as a soldier yelled out, the beer was warm. And he also looked at the command centers. Who made the decisions? How did they make the decisions? They called it pacification, peace, which was a way of saying if we destroy a village, it's pacified. It's George Orwell, war is peace, peace is war. So he was not content to simply show what was happening in the field. He also showed how an industry based on sex workers, the dehumanization of girls and women in Vietnam, uh, grew up around the war. So little girls would sell girly pictures and their older sisters would work as sex workers. So he was somebody who also looked at the infrastructures, how villages were set up, the governance was set up. Again, it wasn't simply, here's the spectacle of war, but it was something else. American troops basically assaulting a Vietnamese woman. You didn't see this in terms of the depiction of war. You did, it, it was supposed to be heroic, and often it wasn't. Or the car salesmen who used to visit the soldiers in the field selling them cars, so when they came back to the United States, they could live the quote-unquote American dream, and as it got too dangerous, they just mailed them the brochures. He also photographed the pilots who dropped the napalm from, from 10,000 meters in the air. Very, very few people connected the air war to what was on land, to the pilot and the person who was burned, using the montage of layout. So to me, the Vietnam Inc., 1971, is one extraordinary model on how you look at infrastructure, systems, underlying ideas. He was very sardonic, critical, as opposed to simply adding more images to the spectacle, the synthetic. I'm taking this moment to say that we live in a different moment now, and it's being recognized broadly by people in security, by people in insurance, by people in law, but often not in the photographic community. So for example, neither of these women exist. These are synthetic images. All these women are synthetic. They're not people, but they look like people, as does this child. There's a website in Argentina of uh, generated photos, and here you have 2,684,000 free artificial intelligence generated photos. I copied this image this week. And you could choose, for example, which ones you want. Uh, and they're used in all kinds of different industries now. It's, it's been suggested that they use, be used to show how diverse certain institutions are by adding people of color when there are no people of color working there. Um, so for example, here you have a choice on the left, I asked for beautified, left-facing young black people, and that's what I got. None of these people exist. Or I asked for natural young, white, blonde hair, long hair, joy, joyous females. None of these people exist. Or beautified infant, joyful person. None of these people exist. You could do it yourself. And so the issue then becomes for people in photography, once these images are distributed and used more and more widely, the actual images, how will we know the difference? They argue, for example, on the site that you can make a generated image of yourself, a synthetic one, it's not you, but you could put it online so you're harder to trace, or you could use uh, your own face or anybody's face without worrying about likeness rights. You don't have to pay anybody because the person doesn't exist. This also raises issue for child pornography. You could have synthetic children who don't exist, and therefore the laws in certain countries, uh, it's, it would be much more difficult to prosecute people for it. But that you begin to live in an environment in which it's very difficult to know 
what actually happened in the world or not. So one of the stock photo agencies, the guy was just interviewed, and he said that in five years, you'll have the choice of generating either 100% synthetic photos right from the toolbar or merging those synthetic elements with real life photos to create something completely new. So he's arguing stock photography in 2026, uh, that the client will be able to generate a new image that looks like a photograph, but is not a photograph. So what we're facing at this point is a new era in which much of what we do is going to be viewed with skepticism. And I think we need to come up with solutions. Um, one of the arguments I've made for a long time is that analog photography of the last uh, century is Newtonian, cause and effect, continuous. And, and the discrete pixels, zeros and ones, the integers, is much more quantum, which is alternative. And we see that in Jonas Ben Dixon's work, which I'm sure you know at this point. A book on Veles in North Macedonia, which was a center of misinformation in the United States. And he uh, published this book several months ago. I spoke to him. I was sworn to secrecy. He made these images, and none of the people exist. They're all synthetic. There's a 5,000-word essay that accompanies it that was created by artificial intelligence. And what he was doing was doing a test to see if anybody picked up on it, and nobody did, including people at Magnum. He's a Magnum photographer. So, you know, and, and at Perpignan, they showed the work as actual photography. So if the photo community doesn't see the difference, you know, obviously the challenge is what is the public going to think? And fake news, alternative facts, and so on and so forth will only accelerate in terms of people's um, you know, perception and misperception of the world. So we, you know, one of the arguments I make also is appearance. Photography was the 20th century, the phenotype, genotype now, the algorithm is much more important in the 21st century. So we see things like this. This sold at, at $432,000. Um, at Christie's auction two or three years ago, it was supposed to sell at seven to ten thousand dollars. So it sold at about forty times more than it was supposed to, and it turned out it was made by algorithm. So a lot of what we're seeing now in music and increasingly in photography and painting is algorithmic work. It's not by people anymore. And again, we have to contemplate that and ask ourselves, what's the difference? So we have Max Pinker's work, the trophy camera, which you may know, which uh, analyzes uh, photographs captured. And if there's a 90% chance, according to the software, that it would win the World Press Photo Award, it keeps the image. Otherwise, it rejects the image. Um, you know, and that, that's kind of a provocation as well, just like Bendixson, in terms of the fact that many of the images that are chosen are so similar to each other and, and kind of the same stereotypes over and over again. One of the uh, questions I have is whether it might make sense to have a photojournalistic camera, one that does not allow the photographer to change the image, to modify it, but you know is basically a record of a quotation from appearances, a record of what's being seen. You know, do we need to move somewhere like that? And and um, you know, it's, it's an idea from John Berger that a photograph is a quotation from appearances. I like that idea very much, that if we think of the documentary photograph like a quotation of words, you can't change somebody's words if you're quoting them. If we think of it as a quotation from the visible, you know, maybe that's a way that we could start to distinguish what we do in the documentary field from synthetic imagery, from photoshopped imagery, like this, you know, 1982, the original image on the right, National Geographic going back in time to, uh, to move the photographer a couple of meters to one side to get a different point of view. Um, this was the first future news photograph, the two ice skaters to meet the next day. Uh, this was a, from a Finnish newspaper, uh, a, a, a Swedish airplane crash, and they did it without any photographer present and without a camera. They just asked the eyewitnesses what did it look like, and they composited it. And I want to remind us that in Finland, the Photographers Association at that time 
in the 1990s came up with the letter M for montage to be put on such images to differentiate them from uh, you know, photographs that were not modified or montaged. And we've kind of abandoned that. But I think it's something that we need to think about again with some urgency because you know, in a year, two years from now, uh, there'll be more and more and more, you know, synthetic imagery, deep fakes, uh, videos, uh, you know, that uh, of things that never happened, and we have to, in our industry, contemplate it as well. So part of this is like I've been working a little bit with uh, Shoah, the Shoah Foundation, the Holocaust Foundation, and their concern is, in in years to come, will people believe? that concentration camps actually happened based on photographs. And there's a consortium called the Content Authenticity Initiative that's using things like blockchain to try to stamp imagery so it, it can be traced back and authenticated uh, that they actually happen. But again, the people outside the field of photography are very, very concerned that the photograph will no longer be a historical record. I wrote a piece on uh, students in Columbine High School in the U.S., where there was a major massacre uh, shooting, and they came up with a plan on their ID cards and cell phones that if they're killed, if they're shot in high school, going to school, they want the photographs to be distributed. They believe in the testimony of the photographs. You know, and again, the issue of credibility that we have to make sure that they remain credible or George Floyd, uh, the killing of George Floyd in the United States in Minneapolis, the video by a teenage young woman uh, was probably the one uh, imagery that changed the United States and, and to some extent the world in terms of race relations more than any other. And you know, one of the fears is if we get to a place of deep fakes and so on and so forth, will it still have the credibility that it had recently? You know, can we still sustain it? And I think, you know, those of us in the field, uh, you know, Marshall McLuhan had the idea that the fish are the last to know about the water. They don't know it's wet because they don't know what dry is. You know, once you're inside a field, you, you don't necessarily realize to what extent these things on the outside have become extraordinarily important and need to be, uh, you know, I think photographers associations in different countries, you know, need to come up with standards that then become international so that people have a sense of the ability to differentiate between an actual photograph, a record of what happened versus something synthetic or modified. So the, you know, I, I now want to look at just a few strategies by different photographers in the 21st century to try to do things a little differently. This is Gustavo Hermano in Argentina. And what he did is he took pictures from a couple of decades before. This is him and his brothers. And then he did the same scene 20 years later or so of people who have been disappeared by the, by the government, uh, you know, disappeared and never heard from again during the dictatorship. So this is his own family. Gustavo is on the left, and one of his brothers was disappeared. These are two brothers, and only one survived. These are two sisters, and only one survived. So the idea that photography doesn't only have to be about the past, but also the implications of the past on the present. The sister has to live without her sister, who has disappeared. So it's not just placing it in, in the past, but it's bringing it into the present. You know, the baby had to grow up without her parents. So in Argentina, there's been an awful lot of work in terms of memory, in terms of how to bring memory into the present. And I just wanted to bring that into the discussion. Also, the photograph typically has been something the camera never lies. It's all about the answer. But there are people who are opening it up to also be about the question. This is Gilles Perez in Iran during the Islamic Revolution. We published this when I was picture editor of the New York Times magazine, a vision of Iran. Not what's going on, but a question of what is going on. So that the photographer who's French living in New York in Iran, who doesn't speak the language, is asking questions, what's going on? So that the photograph itself can interrogate 
much like Kent's work, I think, does in, in The Tree Called Home. It asks questions. What is going on? And it asks the reader to share in co collaborating with the answers, as opposed to, you know, this idea we have that a photographer can arrive in a foreign country, make pictures, and suddenly give us answers when he or she doesn't really know what's going on. Also, the idea that photography can be uh, both first person and third person photojournalism. Carte Bresson said to me that photojournalism is keeping a journal, a diary with a camera. So this was uh, De Pardon, Raymond De Pardon, 40 years ago, uh, published in Liberation. It was 30 days working in New York City, one photograph a day with his caption. So it's raining, it's raining, it's Independence Day, it's a holiday, the city's empty. He makes a visit to the Statue of Liberty, he discusses all night with a girlfriend, I want to go back to France to leave everything. I force myself to make a photo. I ask myself, what am I doing? Um, everything's sad, it's a bad day. I, I start to read the novel G by John Berger. So the idea, you know, in this age of fake news, alternative facts, that sometimes it's the first person of the photographer how the photographer experienced it, responded, reacted, that can also create a link with the reader. Uh, the work in Harlem, at that time, you know, I was at the New York Times then, and we would photograph uh, uh, drug dealing and murders in Harlem. We didn't publish pictures like this of everyday life, you know, or Wall Street. So, so Dippard Holmes' work you know, to me from 1981 is interesting even now because it raises the issue of the photographer as author, as opposed to just the supplier of images, but as author of the photographs with feelings, with perceptions. Also the movement into conceptual documentary that we're seeing now, so that Roland Barth has the idea of the active reader, that it's not just the photographer who determines meaning, but the reader in collaboration. So this is work by Anton Kusters. Um, he went to 1,078 concentration camps for World War II, and he made three Polaroid photographs of blue skies over each one. So the idea being that you have to imagine what happened. He's not showing you. We've seen it before. He's also asking you to imagine that Syrian refugees and boats are also under blue skies or Rohingya people in China who are being placed into camps are also under blue skies. It's opening up ideas about uh, indirection. There's also a, a soundscape that goes from 1933 to 1945 of a beep. And every time you hear the beep, Somebody else has died in a concentration camp. When we did a conference in New York about this work after about an hour and a half, I think it was like 142 people had died. So the idea that you, you have to imagine, photography doesn't have to be just the showing. You could ask the reader to collaborate in imagination also. This is the map of the concentration camps. The uh, red ones are the extermination extermination camps. And the Swiss publication ran all 1,078 Polaroids of all 1,078 concentration camps, many of which there's not even a, barely a plaque showing that it ever existed. This is something we did at Pixel Press many years ago by uh, to uh, a Dutch photographer and, and writer. And what we did here, this was online. And so the idea would be that you had to imagine what was going on as opposed to being told. And then if you put the cursor, the mouse over the image, you would then find the caption. But first you have to imagine, often the caption defines it. So you don't actually look at the photograph. You don't really uh, contemplate it. You know, and, and, and I find this really interesting because you don't know what's going on. You imagine it because often otherwise you just read it. The one brother, they're twins, has hydrocephalus, the other is death. Um, or this was a project for Amnesty International. This was the last meals of prisoners who were executed in the United States where we have the death penalty. This is what he requested. And then he was executed in 97, but he was presumed innocent three years later. So this is what he ate before he was killed. 
It was reconstructed from the menu. And this is him, or this is what he ate before he was killed. And then they found 13 years later that he was probably innocent. So again, it's indirect as opposed to direct. It's, it's asking the reader to imagine as opposed to the, uh, the idea of photography is simply showing. Also the idea that photography does not have to react. It could be proactive ahead of time. It could avoid disasters, help avoid disasters as opposed to wait for them to happen. So this is Gideon Mendel. In South Af in Africa, they had this very racist idea that if you gave uh, antiretroviral drugs for HIV to uh, people sick, they would not take the medicine. They wouldn't be disciplined enough. So NGOs, governments were not giving money. So he went to a pilot program in South Africa, where he's from, for over four years, and he watched what happened. This woman took her medicine. Here she is with her sons, a capable person. And I have this email from UNAID saying that 8 million people are in treatment today, largely because of his photographs. So rather than waiting for the most graphic imagery of people dying of AIDS, he decided to work ahead of time and prevent it. And in part, 8 million people are in treatment because of the work. These images are not celebrated the way the images, the graphic images of disaster often are. But I think they're more important in some ways because he was helpful in preventing the worst. The same with climate change. Instead of waiting for the worst to happen, what kind of images could be made so the worst does not happen? A proactive photography, a peace photography. If you look in the library, there's usually many, many volumes of war photography and very, very few, if any, of what might be called peace photography. It's also the idea of sharing the power with the protagonist. I, I've discussed with a friend, can we use the word subject, uh, a friend at Al Jazeera, and we argued, no, you can't. You cannot call people your subject. It, 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 it involves a hierarchy of power. It's your protagonist. It's your hero of sorts. And so the idea that when World Press Photo, this was the picture of the year, affluent Lebanese drive down the street to look at a destroyed neighborhood, 2006, the caption was incorrect. This is the photo of the year. It turned out to be they lived on the street. These people, they were coming back to see it. The woman herself making a phone video, which I would have loved to be able to click on the camera of the woman and see what she saw versus what the foreign photographer saw. And when they were interviewed, they said something very interesting. They said, of course, you know, they don't think, uh, you know, that we would live there because the jury of world press would never think that bad things happen to people who look like them. It happens to other people. But they, in fact, lived on the block. So, you know, I've worked with a lot of my students on what I call interactive portraits, where you share the power. This is Josue Rivas, who's indigenous, North American, and he's been created a, a practice of collaborative portraiture, a ceremony in which he, he shares the power with the person he's depicting. And he uses it both for the person and themselves to deal with their own trauma and he to deal with his own trauma as an indigenous person. You know, the indigenous futurists, you know, the idea being that a lot of the, uh, the thinking of indigenous people, in fact, is what we have to come back to if we want to have any hope of having a more holistic world, you know, which does not destroy itself. Or I worked with this Ashima, is a former student of mine from India, and this is an interactive portrait. So she makes a portrait of the man, and then she turns the camera around. She asks them, is this you? Do you think that photo represents you? No, because I'm a smiling person. I actually like um, to be smiling, you know? I, I do that just about most of the day. So if, so if you're not smiling, it's not you? Huh? So if you're not smiling, it's not you? Yes, it's me, but I mean, um, that picture, I mean, definitely, I, I don't think it really tells me because it more look like I'm, I'm sad or something like that. Do you think this is a photo that depicts you? <laughs> 
that says who you are? No. Why not? Because I don't think any picture ever will. Why? Because it's just, you can't see inside of a person in a picture. You can see parts of them that leak through, but that's just a glimpse. And this is a student of mine from Indonesia, and she showed the man two pictures of himself and asked him to choose. So he chose this one because it was a laid back photograph. It does not look like someone is occupied with work or busy doing things. I'm just resting. So Francisco gave him a choice which portrait he preferred, and this is what he preferred. So the idea of collaborating with with the person one is, is portraying to share the power. When I've shown this at times to professional photojournalists, they accuse me of taking away their power. And I'm arguing that I'm giving more possibility uh, and the digital gives more possibility. You couldn't do this with film, turn the camera around and just show the image, but now you can, and you could actually create a dialogue. Is this you or not? So people without agency, um, now have agency. People who are often considered poor or, or the other, uh, you know, can actually speak back and say, is this me or not me? Or you could use it for self-portrait. This was Ashraya, also a student of mine from India, and she, she created this as a self-portrait, and then you click, and she and her husband, this is how she felt living in Texas in the United States. So I'm, I'm you know, going to talk just, just uh, briefly now about the Four Corners project. This is in 2004, a project that I suggested at World Press Photo. I got a standing ovation and nobody ever followed through. But the idea being that online, in the digital format, you could template the four corners of the image and you could roll over, uh, the reader could roll over and find out information uh, about the different pictures, uh, increase the context. So for example, you know, this, this is a very famous image. You could roll over on the bottom right, you get the caption and the credit. And then you can uh, click on the photographer's name and get their code of ethics. I, I wrote this for her, you know, it's fair use, but I said, well, all photography is interpretive. As a photojournalist, my photographs are meant to respect the visible facts of the situation I depict. I do not add or subtract elements to or from my photographs. So to me, it becomes interesting. The reader could then get your code of ethics. What do you do and what don't you do in an image? On the bottom left, it's the backstory. And you know, I, I found a quote from the photographer talking about uh, what it felt like to photograph. You know, how terrible was her to photograph. But then again, I'm happy that the world finally cares and is mourning the dead children. I hope my picture can contribute to changing the way we look at immigration in Europe and that no more people have to die on the way out of a war. And then on the upper left, related imagery. So you could add images, you know, te uh, uh, photographs, video, drawings, um, you know, the way Kent used, uh, for example, drawings in, in A Tree Called Home. Um, and here you actually see the young boy who died and his brother. So it's not a generic image of a dead child, but you actually see him, you know, at home as, as a living, fun-loving kid, uh, you know, as opposed to a, a, a kind of, uh, you know, just a moment of death. And so you could use that in multiple ways. And on the upper right, you know, is the links to other websites. So for example, here I link to Human Rights Watch saying why it's ethical to show a photograph of a dead child, normally when they don't do it. But in this case, they thought there was a greater good. So you could, you could link in different ways. The code of ethics, you know, I just wrote these, you could write your own. Fashion photographer, I do not photograph underweight models whose body mass index is lower than that established by health authorities. Wildlife photographer, all my photographs to depict animals in the wild, unless otherwise specified, you know, they don't do it in zoos. UNICEF, I do not show the faces of children who are HIV positive or have been child soldiers because UNICEF is against that, because the child could be re-victimized. Fine art photographer, 
you pursue your own vision, a photojournalist, you, you have certain standards. Um, a sports photographer, I do not restage events, whatever you want to write. And you can link back to your own website and so on. So, for example, the U.S. invasion of Haiti in 1994 to bring democracy to Haiti. Uh, this was, you know, seen in the press. But the related imagery was this. This is what it actually looked like from the side. You know, the photographers photographing, uh, they were the only ones, you know, the, 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 the soldiers were just there. But it looked like a kind of World War II invasion for the good against evil, democracy. But this is actually what it looked like from the side. I remember there was a um, peace conference in the Sinai uh, desert, uh, or, or I think we're in a lot for uh, the Palestinian peace talks a number of years ago with Jordanian, Palestinian, Israeli Americans there. And they spent half a million dollars to air condition it, it was outdoors. So nobody would be sweating because that would look like the peace talks are not going well. And I always wondered, why didn't a photographer show the air conditioners, related imagery? It was staged. You know, instead, and maybe they could have used the half a million dollars to build two schools instead. For this, this was a hashtag, if they gunned me down in the United States, young African-American men and women, the feeling is that the media would publish images distributed of them as so-called gangsters if the police shot and killed them. So they came up with images um, themselves, the graduation. This is who I am as well. I'm not just the so-called gangster, and I refuse to be depicted that way. I want to self-represent. I want to show myself differently. You know, I want to be somebody seen otherwise, like that. So a lot of what I'm talking about really is uh, using the digital imaging, using multimedia, using nonlinearity, hypertext, using all these possibilities to do things differently, uh, enable the, uh, the protagonist, the person depicted, to have a say, enable the reader to collaborate on establishing meaning, you know, bringing history into the present, using things indirectly, conceptually, acknowledging that you're a person as a photographer, establishing that you're an author, you're not simply a provider of images, and looking at the systems underneath what's going on, uh, you know, what's causing, uh, you know, in time of pandemic, what are the systems uh, at work versus simply you know, showing the typical, uh, you know, doctors, nurses, patients, what else can be shown on climate change? What are the economic interests at play about climate change? What can be done differently? And how can you work proactively, you know, so that five, 10, 15 years ago, the worst of climate, uh, from now, the worst of climate change does not happen, but is prevented. So what, what I'm arguing for in this Four Corners and in general, is a much more expanded photography, expanding the frame, a kind of a sense that with synthetic imagery, deep fakes, we have to do everything possible to establish what is a photograph in order for it to be credible. What are the parameters we use in making photographs? Let the reader know what is our code of ethics? Um, is it a quotation from appearances? Does it have to be labeled otherwise if it's something different? You know, how do we establish the historical record? Because, you know, one of the arguments in all this uh, it goes back to Doctors Without Borders, Bernard Kushner, in the 1960s. He said, without a photograph, there is no massacre. Nobody believes the eyewitness, the survivor. It's subjective. But the photograph is viewed as credible, as testimony as evidence. And, you know, one of the arguments that, that for me right now is if we do not amplify the field, if we do not be transparent about what we're doing with the reader, if we don't uh, try to uh, work hard to, to, to keep the authenticity of the image, then people in rich countries could be skeptical about massacres, skeptical about climate change, skeptical about the suffering of others, because after all, photographs 
may no longer be credible. And that, that, that is the fear that I work against. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to discuss, I think we have about 10 minutes left, if there are any questions, thoughts, or comments. Thank you for that. Um, any questions here? I can see how they are thinking. Uh, thank you for, here, here's one. Uh, I'll pass you the microphone so he can hear you in New York. <laughs> exactly. Thank you for your uh, very um, interesting uh, talk. Uh, um, I, I would like to quote, uh, or at least uh, yeah, well, quote Roland Barthes, uh, he's saying that um, uh, the problem with photographic image is that uh, reality uh, is what we look at or try to find in, in the picture. And um, that's what your project is, to save uh, reality in the pictures, I would say. Uh, but with the, the, um, uh, the beginning of your speech, your speak, uh, speech was uh, more the challenge to that, um, and um, thinking further on with uh, Bart would be that uh, the photographic image is uh, coming closer to the modern art, where reality is no longer at stake. Um, would you say that uh, it's possible to save um, reality in, in uh, the photographic image? Well, I, I think the term reality is, is not the best term because, you know, there are multiple realities. A novel can be more real than a nonfiction. You know, fiction can be more real at, at certain levels. What I'm getting at is that the photograph as a lens-based uh, mechanism was a record of the visible. Within the frame, it was a record of the visible, just like an audio recording is the record of what's said. We all know that it's not objective. We all know that it's not true in an absolute sense. But we do know it's a record. So if you're saying these seven people were in the room and the photograph shows it, you know, the photograph has a certain credibility that way. If you ask somebody and they say, I think there are seven people in the room, it doesn't have the same credibility. So for example, if there's a, a massacre happening in a foreign country and you see a photograph of it, you know, traditionally or, or typically in the 20th century, it had a credibility, it was a visible record. You could argue to some extent, you know, was it an actual, why did it happen? Should it have happened? What do we do about it? But it was a reference point. And so I'm arguing more for reference points than for reality. You know, that this is, you know, with Ken's pictures in, in the, you know, that he's showing in a tree called home, we don't suddenly say that place doesn't exist. You know, the, the photographs themselves and, and Leonid's uh, you know, work as, as a psychologist who worked there, which amplifies it, and then the, the artistry of you know, the people who live within it, all those things together you know, create a context of believability, of credibility that that place exists. And the photograph is often taking the lead there. So again, the war in Afghanistan, 20 years of war with zero iconic imagery, it, the photograph did very little. I remember the, uh, the uh, I, I, I moderated a panel discussion in New York right after the US invaded Afghanistan and the front page of the New York Times was some guys with long beards and turbans sitting on the ground in Afghanistan, and I said to somebody on the panel who was a photo editor at the New York Times, why did you choose that image? You know, what does it mean? 
And he said, well, it reminded me of Sunday school when I was a kid, you know, a kind of Bible stories. And it's a terrible reason to choose an image. It's like inflicting a stereotype on another country. So that's not real. That's not true. It's, it's, it's a record, though. It's a reference point. So all these things have to happen together where we acknowledge which images are records, reference points, are the images themselves, what kind of context do they need to explain what they're really about, how can we incorporate the points of view of the people in the images, the bystanders, historians, whoever, you know, have something to add to it because the photograph itself is insufficient. But can it still remain a visible record, at least at certain times? And I know, like, when I published in Sweden in 1990, the In Our Own Image book, I wrote the first book on digital imaging and the issues of manipulation. It was published by Justa Fleming. And then the Swedish military published a book, What Do We Do About It? You know, what do we believe in society? What's actually happened and not happened? So, you know, the, uh, at, that's the level I'm talking about. At the level of truth, you know, what is it? authentic, what is true, uh, you know, you can get at in multiple ways. And th this photograph is only the starting point, you know, as a, as a starting point in Kent's work as well. It's a starting point. But I'm asking the question, do we want the photograph as a reference point to endure? Is that important to us as photographers in the photographic community? That's my question. And if we do want it to endure as a reference point, what do we do about it? You know, do we put a special frame around it and say we didn't tamper with it, we didn't manipulate it? You know, do we define a photograph in a certain way? Or do we allow it to be malleable, changeable, modifiable, like art? And I, I think if we do that, we have to think of the people in need in the world. Because if they say, oh, that's beautiful art, those pictures, uh, we don't have to take it seriously. It's just an artist's rendition. What about the people in the world? Are we, in fact, of any use at that point to the people in the world? Or we have squandered what used to be useful to the people in the world, like the idea that you can use photographs to call to stop a war by the United States happened in 1968. I don't see it happening in 2021. So I'm not sure I answered your question. But I think it's a very, very complicated set of interlocking issues. Thank you. Uh, I have another question here. Yes, uh, I'm actually grabbing the microphone also to say that this was an extremely uh, interesting presentation and hair raising actually <laughs> at uh, many points. And so I wanted to ask you about because there's this concern you raised about the artificiality of images and uh, them losing the power as a testimony. And, um, <clears throat> and you also refer to the ways in which e previously you would have these sort of single images that would have a huge impact. And I was just wondering, what do you think about the, uh, the fact of there being so many people who nowadays can document everything because of the phones, because we have the digital photography everywhere. So whether you could sort of counter this uh, process that you are describing uh, by the kind of idea of uh, active uh, citizen photography. So whereas you have a danger of photographs being manipulated, how that could be countered by the fact that there are tens of photographs of the same event taken by different citizens. Uh, in, in different occasions, whether you see any hope in that kind of direction, the multiplicity of eyes or photographs. Yeah. Thanks. You know, I, I, I think it's really an important point. I think the historical record, that will be useful. But I think in a contemporary sense, you know, when you had a front page of a newspaper that everybody was reading or a similar newspaper, it said these one images, three images, five images are important to look at, to focus on. And now we're seeing so many images from all over the place that it's hard to know what's important. What's the source of it? Is it credible? Is it Photoshop? Uh, can we trust uh, whoever made it? And I think um, at this point, it's kind of like, um, you know, Aldous Huxley, there used to be Orwell and Huxley, uh, 
Aldous Huxley, and Aldous Huxley's idea would be there to be so much stuff that you don't even know what's important anymore. You're just drowning in stuff. There's billions of images every day. So what's important? What, what, what goes forward? And then what happens is it becomes tribal. A certain tribe, a certain group of people believe one image, another group believes another image. And it becomes a kind of war of imagery uh, and it peters out. So I think if I was in government and I was a dictator, I would be very happy to see so many, so many contrasting points of view because there's no way, I don't have to be challenged at that point in government. Occasionally, like in the video of George Floyd, you know, there is an impact uh, at this point, um, but it's still quite rare because, you know, my sense is we often know less about other countries than we ever did. One thing I would like to see happen is high school students, university students curating social media from their neighborhood, from their country, from their city, and telling the rest of us what's important. That's the first assignment I give in class to my students because I usually teach students from all over the world. You know, in Bangladesh, curate your social media and tell us the 10 pictures that we should be looking at. That, I think, would be very, very useful if there were a website or websites in which that kind of work was curated. At this point, it's just chaotic. And, you know, again, I, I use the term meta photography. I think we need meta photographers more than photographers. We need people who can curate the billions of images and tell us what's important, what to look at in order to understand a society. If I want to know about Ethiopia, which are the 20 images this week that I should be looking at? If I want to know about Sweden, which are the 20 images I should be looking at? Otherwise, you know, I end up in stereotypes at this point. I, I know very little. Um, and it's also an issue of how much time we have. I remember talking to a, a, a class of working class people and, and younger people, and the working class people said, I have 10 minutes a day to look at media. I have to make dinner. I have to you know, put the kids to bed. I work, you know, many, many hours a day. I don't have time to look at hundreds or thousands of images. I need in 10 minutes to be told what's going on. And we're not doing that for people at this point. So there's problems when you do that of hierarchies of power, but at the same time, there's also something useful in terms of climate change. What are the 20 images I should be looking at this week? I have no idea. So the one I keep going back is, is the earth in 1968. Because, you know, to me, that, that, that makes sense. But I'm not sure about everything else. I don't know what's inflated, you know, and so on and so forth. So, yes, historically, it, it's very useful. Uh, we've seen in the Arab Spring, for example, social media being incredibly important. And for the most part, it was not strong enough to, to get the societies into a more democratic, a more holistic place. So it's useful but it's also problematic and it has to be addressed. I think an entire conference needs to be come up with how do you use social media in more effective ways in contemporary society, not just for the historical record, but how do we do it on subjects, you know, whether it's COVID or climate change or whatever it would be, uh, so that somebody curates for us and tells us what to look at as opposed to just getting a mass of images. Thank you for that. Um... Time's up, and uh, I hope to see you in person in Sweden next time. And um, thank you for this uh, incredibly inspiring and interesting speech. Um, thank you. Thank you all very much. Have a good day. Thank you.